so many of these have happened. People are angry. They want to know why, why don't we do something? Why is nothing happening? And the challenge is not just to do something, but to do something that would work. None of the laws that have been presented here in the past would have prevented any of these attacks, including the one yesterday. But that doesn't mean there isn't anything to do. To those who say now that it's not the time to talk about gun violence because it's too soon, we don't want to politicize right after a tragedy, that's what is said over and over, then I would ask, when is the time? Wow. Think about that. You have Florida's two senators. They sit on the opposite sides in a political aisle, but, uh, and they're questioning what can be been done to prevent another tragedy like the one that hit their home state yesterday. Both senators, of course, demanding change in the wake of the deadliest mass shooting in Broward County, uh, at, in Broward County and, of course, I think perhaps uh, in, in the state of Florida. Here with me now, David Bonson, founder of the Bonson Group, also author of Crisis of Responsibility and a National Review contributor and back with us as well, Deneen Borelli. David, I began your book and, um, you know, it's, it's the blame game, uh, the origins of the blame game and how it's roiled our political system. Well, it's going to have a chance to roil it again because, uh, you know, the finger pointing has begun. How do we get to solutions if the knee-jerk reaction is always the blame game? Well, we don't. That's the first step. We have to stop the knee-jerk reaction being the blame game. There are solutions to get to. There are things we have to do, discuss. But when we start with this, and not just 24 hours later, 24 minutes later, last night, they're going straight into this issue of, of all kinds of blame, third parties and, and other um, issues that make no sense. It's a cultural problem. We have to start with moral agency. I don't understand where we lost clarity about right and wrong. It's just, it's just incredible to me. But people can, have a, people can have a shared assessment of what's wrong and two different opinions on how to make it right, though. Oh, well, in any situation, look at most marriages, for example. I mean, it's, you know, not, and, and not to belittle this whole uh, conversation and issue because it is very serious, but of course you're going to have two different uh, ideas and, and perspectives on, on perspectives on one issue. But it is about uh, figuring out what the country needs to do as a whole and not the finger pointing, just as you mentioned. And really, with this individual, this comes down to his mental capacity. And too many people saw the red flags. They did mention it to the individuals, the authorities, and nothing was done about it. Do you think that's something where uh, th this time around we'll probably see some changes, some, all, uh, some tweaks, if you will, uh, with respect to the mental evaluation process toward gun, gun ownership, David? Well, I think that there is um, uh, room for improving in the process of that. I'm not convinced that that was really the issue here. More and more, what's really kind of bothering me is we're finding out this was actually a very astute young man. This thing was highly premeditated, a lot of time. It was, but in, but in, in the process of it being highly premeditated, it was also highly telegraphed. I mean, he was expelled from the school. He was a bully. He, you know, you, you have a checklist. I saw a checklist of 10 things to look out for, and he... He was at least nine of them. That's right. And, and, and they, were, they were telegraphable in the sense of his moral shortcomings, his, his, the questions of his character. Go, and so, you know, in hindsight, certainly there's things, like you said, nine out of ten that were very telegraphable. But I think that ultimately the idea that a little policy tweak legislatively could have prevented it, it just isn't true. Well, I, I, I think the idea that we can prevent all of these, uh, no one believes that. Uh, but, but also, and the pendulum can swing too far, uh, Deneen. Uh, I always look at guns as inanimate. In inanimate objects, right? And it's the people behind the gun. It's just sort of like, you know, you, you can't get a cheeseburger doesn't make you fat unless you eat it, right? And you don't want to simplify it, but I think the focus, uh, you know, the idea of taking guns away, particularly from, from rifle gun owners, goes too far. But then the middle ground here is folks are saying, well, an AR-15 is an assault rifle. Most most hunters I know say no. It's, 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 auto, it's semi-automatic, but it's, there's a distinct difference. Listen, I'm a licensed gun owner. What you do is go through the proper training and screening in order to get the gun. You have to be a responsible individual. And just like you said, it's an inanimate object. And it is, it's the individual that does the shooting. It's not the gun. So, guys, uh, having said that, will anything change, uh, you know, with this? Or will this just be another one of these periods where there's a lot of finger pointing, a lot of animosity, David? But will anything change with respect to maybe finding common ground and a common solution? No, it won't change politically. What's going to have to change eventually, whether it's this incident or whether it takes years to get there, is a remoralization of the culture. We right. need to come back to right and wrong, Charles. Yeah, and I would also add, you know, 
Uh, well, I would, I would bring God back in the school Amen. and, and a pledge right. of allegiance. I would bring both of those things back. Amen. Thank you both very much. Appreciate it. All right, folks, here's Lou Dobbs.